response to the United States Catholic Conference Bishops call for action on racism by the Image and Likeness Committee of St. Thomas More. As the bishops point out in their pastoral letter, brothers and sisters to us, the impact of hundreds of years of discrimination has been a crushing burden for African-American families. For many, racial identity has created an iron curtain barring the way to a decent life and livelihood. Perhaps most painful, also verbalized by the bishops, is that not only has our country betrayed its black citizens, but so has our church. It is in this spirit that the ILC shares with you a plan to engage St. Thomas More in the process of healing. Hello everyone, my name is Maxine Mason Huggins. I'm a parishioner here at St. Thomas More, a member of the Image and Likeness Committee and a native of Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I attended Northside Elementary and Lincoln High Schools, the only two schools for African Americans at the time. I was a protester in the 60s for civil rights and justice for all. I was in several sit-ins in front of white-owned businesses, had a water hose turned on me, walked picket lines, and was in jail a few hours because of the sit-ins. I will be your narrator for this slideshow presentation and will guide you through each slide with a short explanation. We hope you enjoy it, we hope you find it interesting, and we hope you will learn something new. If this mission interests you, come join our group with your ideas on how we can continue moving forward. We'd like to begin with one small quote, brothers and sisters to us. An honest look at the past makes plain, plain the need for restitution wherever possible, makes evident the justice of restoration and restitution. We chose this quote out of many we could have selected from because the ILC does not believe it is sufficient merely to acknowledge the sins of the past or even to acknowledge the existence of racism today in our secular society, in our church. Rather, as the bishops have encouraged we have spent significant time reflecting on the means of combating it. During the 1400s and well into the 1600s, papal bulls were issued by Pope Nicholas V and later Pope Alexander VI that not only authorized the perpetual enslavement of Africans and allowed for the seizures of non-Christian lands, but also morally sanctioned the development of the transatlantic slave trade. At first, the church limited the African slave trade to King Alfonso of Portugal. The papal bull of 1455, written by Pope Nicholas V, justified acquisition of more African captives and territory. This became the green light for more ships sailing across dangerous seas to foreign lands Often upon arrival, husbands were separated from wives and separated from children in order to get the highest price as they sold their captives into slavery. In the land area that became the United States, the Catholic Church introduced African slavery in the 16th century, long before 1619. In fact, at various moments in American history, from the colonial era to the American Civil War, the church was the largest corporate slaveholder in Florida, Louisiana, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. After the abolition of slavery, parishes were segregated. As churches began to integrate, Many parishes relegated people of color to segregated seating, usually in the back of the church or up in the balcony, while white parishioners received the Holy Eucharist before black parishioners 
and in some churches there were separate doors designated for entry, one for whites and one for blacks. Augustus Tolton was the first black Roman Catholic priest to be ordained in the United States in 1886. So dedicated was he to become a priest that he pursued his education in Rome after being denied access to seminaries in the United States solely based on the color of his skin. One of the largest slave camps in the state that you may be familiar with is in Stagville, North Carolina, located just outside of Durham. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is one of the largest universities in the state, and it was built by slave labor for the white sons of slave owners known as the gentry class. A line item in student fees, which was $2, gave each white student the privilege to have a slave for whatever services that were needed. White people enslaved black people to work in the kitchens, cleaning, and to do groundwork. In a white man's world, they thought that was all black people were capable of doing. During the 1800s and much of the 1900s, all schools and workplaces were segregated. Chapel Hill schools were not fully integrated until 1966. If you were able to finish the sixth grade, you were lucky. Higher education was denied. Black women nursed white babies, cleaned and cooked while the men were doing groundwork or working in the fields. It was a social event when black people were lynched. It was like having a party. Manly McCauley was lynched in Carborough, North Carolina in 1898 because he fell in love with and married a white woman. Jim Crow's impact on black people's lives kept them from voting, fair housing, jobs, farming, and upward mobility. Nothing was available that was fair for a black person and how we had to live and survive. When the New Deal and later the GI Bill were created, they were intended for the white race only. Economic inequality between black and white Americans hasn't changed much in the last 50 years. Since the government wouldn't guarantee mortgage loans for black Americans, they were excluded from establishing equity when home values rose at unprecedented rates after World War II. Housing equity is two thirds of wealth so this locked in the wealth gap between blacks and whites. While a lot of white people like to think the civil rights movement fixed everything, racism is a generational trauma and many of the issues remain. Today, black Americans are overrepresented in lower paid, less secure jobs with fewer benefits. For the past 40 years, Poverty and unemployment rates for black Americans have been at least double that of whites. Between 1983 and 2016, typical black household incomes have been cut in half, while medium white household incomes have risen by a third. Depending on the year and the source you look at, black men are five to 11 times more likely than white men to be incarcerated, which is an economic-like sentence for the man's family. During 2008 housing crisis, blacks who had been steered to subprime loans were foreclosed more than whites and lost a larger proportion of their wealth. Medium overall net worth of white households was nearly eight times that of African-American households, according to Federal Reserve. 2020 data. About one in four black households had no wealth or were in debt in 2021, compared with about one in 10 U.S. households, according to the Pew Research Center. Today, one-fifth of black families have a net worth of zero or less, and 75% of black families have less than 
$10,000 saved for retirement. In the U.S., 78% of black adults don't think the country has done enough to ensure their equality. When these same adults are questioned further, 64% say it's unlikely that racial equality will ever be achieved in this country. In 1951, four African-American students were admitted to UNC School of Law by court order. In 1960, the Chapel Hill Nine group from Lincoln High School was formed, which brought on protests, demonstrations, arrests, and much more to get the town to integrate and to treat black people fairly. In 2018, Silent Sam, the Confederate statue, was taken down from UNC campus. In 2020-2021, UNC renamed three buildings, and in the same year, 120 enslaved people buried in Bobby Cemetery were honored. So much was hidden. White people never wanted any of their evil wrongdoings revealed, and it was never approved or allowed to talk about what happened to our ancestors or to teach about it in any school. I know this firsthand. I was one of the students and protesters. I was there in the crowd. I'm the person in the white blouse, a St. Thomas More parishioner. Today, our surrounding communities are now trying to correct this wrong. In 1838, Pope Gregory XVI and later Pope Leo XIII issued papal bulls condemning slavery. Sadly, the attitude of many white Catholic slave owners themselves were very different, so nothing changed. In the 1950s, Bishop Vincent Waters declared, Let me state here as emphatically as I can, there is no segregation of the races to be tolerated in any Catholic church in the Diocese of Raleigh. In 1953, before the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court, Bishop Waters tried to integrate the parishes in Newton Grove, North Carolina. Unfortunately, his attempt to do so failed. The bishops issued pastoral letters on racism in 1979 and 2018. In 2017, they formed the Ad Hoc Committee Against Racism, urging Catholics to take action. In 2021, action was taken by the Jesuits as they pledged to raise $100 million for the 272 descendants of the enslaved people they once owned and sold in 1838 in order to keep what we now call Georgetown University solvent. To atone by the sin of slavery and to promote racial reconciliation initiatives across the United States, the Descendants Truth and Reconciliation Foundation was created. So let's look at how we can address racism at the local level. In particular, the ILC had proposed and St. Thomas More accepted what we call the Monsignor Thomas P. Hatton African American Reparative Scholarship. This scholarship is focused on repairing the damage done by racism locally by involving the St. Thomas More community. Specifically, the purpose of the program is to support educational aspirations of descendants of enslaved families who were denied opportunity by helping to level the playing field for their achievement and success. In addition, an explanation of the student's ancestral connection to UNC Chapel Hill is required. Priority during application evaluation will be given to students with financial need. The stipend will be distributed by the institution the student attends. We are pleased to note the first awarded student completed their, her freshman year at a local college. In addition to the development of the scholarship, the Image and Likeness Committee at St. Thomas More provided other programs and educational materials 
over the last five years to inform parishioners and promote racial justice, healing, and welcome. Guest speaker in events included Dr. Shannon D. Williams, scholar on the history of black Catholic nuns in the United States and author of Subversive Habits, Danita Mason Hogan's local educator and founder of Bridging the Gap and the James Kate Scholars, and an interview of Dolores Clark and Lori Clark, descendants of Nellie and Tony Strayhorn, who were once enslaved and who were the first black family in Carborough. The town of Carborough recently celebrated the unveiling of a truth plaque at the Strayhorn House at 109 Jones Ferry Road on September 6, 2023. The committee provides historic biographies and multicultural art for the bulletins and for bulletin boards display. It hosted a racial gap simulation for St. Thomas More clergy and staff and helped to support the more recent international festival and the African Heritage Mass at the church. Going forward, one of the results of People of Color survey administered to parishioners by ILC members was a town hall meeting for all parishioners held on November 8th and 15th, 2023. Also, look for our next link in the bulletin to a video by Father Christopher J. Kellerman on the topic of slavery and the Catholic Church. We hope you have learned something about the role of the Catholic Church in the history of slavery and institutional racism in the United States, and also about our efforts to understand and to compensate for its long-term and current effects. We need you. If you are interested or you have any ideas or talents or skills to contribute to St. Thomas More's effort going forward, please consider joining the Image and Likeness Committee. To do so, contact Mary Ellen McGuire at 919-942-6230. In conclusion, we want to share the continuing thoughts of the U.S. bishops on racial equity and open wide our hearts because it so succinctly sums up the ILC's work. The generational effects of slavery, segregation, and the systematic use of violence are realities that must be fully recognized and addressed in any process that hopes to combat racism. As a church, we are a beacon of hope, a tangible sign of Christ's light on this earth. Thank you for your attention.